If you've got your Bible, join me, if you would, in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 7. Matthew 7. Good to see you all. Thank you for coming to church. God will bless you for it. But I want to say thank you. It's good to see you. Matthew 7, verse 15, Beware of false prophets which come unto you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree brings forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree brings forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that brings not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits, what? You shall know. That ought to be a memory verse. Everybody knows that one. That'd be an easy one for us, wouldn't it? By their fruits, ye shall know. Them. Father, help us as we look into your word again. May you illumine our heart and our mind and use it to speak to us in a way that we understand. Help the preacher to preach. Help us all to hear and receive with meekness the engrafted word that's able to save our soul. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. The question for us today found in verse 16 is rather peculiar. Do men gather grapes from thorns. Now that's absurd. Any farmer, any, any uh, gardener knows that that is a rather strange question. Do men gather grapes from thorns or do they gather up figs from thistles? That's just downright foolish. Can you harvest grapes from a thorn bush? Can you go out with a half bushel basket and gather up figs from a thistle patch? Have you ever went to the store and bought a jar of jelly and the label said, made from 100% pure thorn bushes? <laughs> Have you ever opened a pack of fig newtons and had to cut them open slowly to, to get the briars out of them? And thistles and little jaggers and stickers kind of like you have to do when you're eating bluegill, all them tiny little bones that's embedded down in there. Have you ever had to do that with Fig Newtons? No, I haven't either. That's a rather ridiculous question. Do you gather grapes from thorns? Now, I can ask some pretty dumb questions. You just ask Robin after the service. She, she'll say, yeah, 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 he can ask dumb questions. Let me tell you something. Jesus never asked a dumb question. He's the one that asked this question. So evidently there's something more here to the story than what's just meets the eye in, in past glancing. He's talking about something that we all need to pay attention to. He's talking about character. Now initially, in verse 15 I believe, he's talking about false prophets and uh, predatory preachers that he refers to as wolves wearing what? Sheep's clothing, wolves in sheep's clothing. That from a distance they look okay, they sound okay, but you get up close to them and you get to know them and you say, oh my, what big eyes you have. Amen. Oh my, what long ears you have. Oh my, what sharp teeth you have. There's a warning there and Jesus says, verse 15, beware. Be careful. Try the spirits. Search the scriptures. Know and understand. Now, somebody says, well, you're judging people. I'm not judging nobody. Jesus said you'll know them. There will come a knowing, a witness of the spirit. You'll know. Say, well, don't judge me. Don't, no, no, no. No, I'm not judging nobody. Jesus says you'll know. Mom and dad will know. <laughs> Grandma will know. Your spouse will know. Walking in the Spirit, you'll know. The Spirit will reveal you. Stay away from this person. Stay away from that. 
Robin has been my guide for years. Every once in a while, she'll say to me, watch that person. I say, oh, no, no, no. They're, they're good people. You don't have to worry about that. She'll say, watch that person. <laughs> and you know what? She's always right. I hate to admit it, but she's always right. <laughs> Jesus said, be careful. That he said that, that there would come those in his name who would deceive many. Paul said in, in the book of Acts that after he was gone, there would come in those as ravening wolves to scatter the flock. Jesus says, be careful here. But I think there's a bigger application here than just those in the ministry and those behind the pulpit. There, are, there, there is a warning here to everything and, and, and those that we run into in life, you've got to be so careful. Everything that is being promoted and labeled as good and appropriate and necessary and right and acceptable doesn't mean that it's good and right and acceptable and pleasing to God the Father. Multitudes today around the world are flocking to a briar patch to find nourishment for their soul and rest for their spirit and salvation. And they're turning to the briar patch. We live in an age when evil is bottled and sold as good and good is discounted and thrown out as evil. Darkness is promoted as the new light, new and improved light, and light has been covered over with a bushel. Sour has been relabeled as sweet, and sweet has been silenced, and we're not even supposed to be talking about that. If you don't believe me, then you'll find that all in Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20. Isaiah said that a long time ago. Jeremiah said of people of his day, and it applies to now. It says they're wise to do evil, but to do good they have no knowledge. The Lord reminded me of his parting words in the book of Jonah when he said to the reluctant prophet about all the people in Nineveh, they don't even know their right hand from their left. Remember that? We're living in a world like that today. In Luke's passage of this parallel passage that he gives us of what is found in Matthew 7 of our text, Luke says it in a little different way. He said, for every tree is known by its fruit. Now what's he talking about? He's talking about personal character. And he said, a tree is known by its fruit. Some people can look at a cherry tree when cherries are ripe and say, oh, why, look at that. That tree's full of cherries. That's supposed to be a cherry tree. Some people are sharp enough that when they see an apple tree full of apples, they know the difference. They know that's not bananas, that's apples. Some people can look at a peach tree when there's peaches hanging on it and know it's a peach tree. They, they can discern that. They, they know what a peach is. They've ate a peach. They know... But there are some people, even when there's no fruit on the tree, can look at the tree and by the bark and the shape and the size and the leaf, and they know that's an apple tree, that's a pear tree, that's a cherry tree. They, have, they, have, they just know. And the Holy Spirit will reveal to us walking in the Spirit the same thing about people's character. Jesus said, you will know. There comes a knowing, and I'm not talking about being suspicious or, or just dreaming up stuff. He said, you'll know. You'll know by their fruits. Twenty-some years ago, I was cutting creek banks for my Uncle Hubert and uh, dropping trees and clearing brush and, and thicket and honeysuckle that I could just hate and rose bushes running wild and clearing all his creek banks for him. And I run across a little tree. I didn't know what it was. And I left it alone. Dad and Hubert come by an hour or two later, and I called him down into the field, and I said, there's a tree here. I don't know what it is. I'm not familiar with this. Can you tell me what am I looking at? And immediately, both of them at the same time said, that's a persimmon tree. Don't cut it down. Being country boys, there, there was nothing hanging on it. There was no fruit. It was just, they knew by the bark and the shape of the tree, that's a persimmon tree. I said, all right, I've never seen one before. Well, over the years, I, down in the fall, have walked out into the fields and down there and looked at it. And some years it's covered in persimmon, some years just a few. 
couple weeks ago, I just walking, I, I went over there to see if I could find it again. Other trees have grown up, poplars that, you know, they, they grow up overnight. And went down there and I kept looking and looking and I found it. There it was, a whole lot bigger 20 some years later. And there was still some persimmons on it. And there, matter of fact, there was two hanging down low enough I could reach up and get. And I said, well, there's one for me and one for Robin. I put them in my pocket and I took my prize home. She was sitting on the couch reading and I went in and I announced to her that I had some delicacies. <laughs> I said, one for you and one for me. I said, have you ever ate a persimmon? She said, no. I said, oh, you're in for a treat. We've already had a frost, so after a frost, you can eat them, you know, that's when they're good. Yes. Well, evidently, mine was a little riper than hers. <laughs> <laughs> I ate mine. She took about two bites out of the little thing, and it ended up in her hand, and she was... <laughs> <laughs> and she started talking. That's the closest I've ever heard her speaking in tongues. <laughs> Oh, you know, there is an aftertaste <laughs> that just lingers for a long time. You've got to drink a cup of coffee. You've got to eat a, a little Debbie's. You've got to do something, you know. I think everybody ought to experience a persimmon in your life. If you have it, man, you're missing it. <laughs> Jesus said, an evil tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Verse 20, by their fruit, ye shall know them. Fruit doesn't lie. You are what you are. It doesn't lie. And sooner or later, fruit bears out. And everybody knows. Eventually, it, fruit's going to grow, and it will be obvious to all. So what's Jesus saying to us? You and I who come to church on a regular basis and call this our home, what's he saying to us? I think he's telling us that our walk needs to match our talk, doesn't it? That what you see on Sunday morning and what you hear on Sunday morning is what we ought to see and hear on Tuesday afternoon or late night, Friday night or Saturday afternoon. I mean, we are the real deal. That we are letting God work through us and guide us and we are obedient to his word and obedient in prayer and we are, we are saying yes to God constantly. We're not perfect, but we're following him who is. And when he says go, we get our boots on and we go. And when he says stop, we holler whoa, and we stop whatever he says stop about. And if he says go help, we'll get the shovel and the rake and we'll get our mop bucket and go and we'll help. And when he says go forgive, We swallow hard and say, okay, God, with your help, we're, we're going to forgive. And when he says, go apologize, we eat crow and we have to go apologize. And whatever we're, whatever we're called to do, we do. Why? Because our walk and our talk needs to match. You know why? Number one, you have a relationship with God that matters. And number two, there's people watching you and there's people watching me. And they're basing everything they can understand about their Bible or the church or Christianity, they're basing it on your life and mine. Now, whether that's fair or not, I'm not, I'm not going to get into that today. You might say, well, that's not fair, preacher. I'm not Jesus. Everybody needs to look at Jesus. Let me tell you what. I can't help it. They're watching you. And that's not going to change. And they base their opinion of Christianity on your testimony and your life. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. So those that say, well, don't do as I do, just do as I say. Folks, that don't fly. That don't fly. That's, that's not what Jesus called us to. Jesus said, our walk, our talk needs to match. We're the real deal. Now, I think that wolves in sheep cloth sheep's clothing applies to more than just preachers behind the pulpit. There's a lot of people in the world who take the name of Jesus or Christianity and they put a cross on, on, on their, their billboard or they wear a cross, but, you know, nothing's changed on the inside. 
Christian politicians. Maybe, maybe they are. Maybe they are. I don't know. But you know what? Fruit will bear out, won't it? Yes. Christian athletes. Maybe they are. Maybe they're not. Christian businessmen. They want our sales. They want our money. <laughs> or they, I don't know that they're living it. God knows. But then something happens and you find out, you know, afterwards that, that what you saw and what's really on the inside and the people that really know them is two different stories. God help us. If we would all get to verse 12 and live like verse 12, look at that. Therefore, all things whatsoever you would that men should do unto you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Meaning, all the law and all the prophets is the entirety of the, of the Old Testament. It's the whole thing combined. Do unto others as and have them do unto you. Uh, it's been referred to as the golden rule. If we would live like that, if we would just live like that, what a difference it made. Did you know that J.C. Penney's store, have you ever shopped at J.C. Penney's? Most of us have. We, guys, you've walked in and sat on the bench while they wife shot, but we've, we've, been, we've all been there. Did you know that when, when he opened that store over a hundred years ago, James Cash Penny, it was called the Golden Rule Store? That was the original name, the Golden Rule Store. And he tried to treat everybody that worked for him by the Golden Rule. He treated them just like he wanted to be treated. And a customer came in, he treated them like he would want to be treated if he was in there in the store. That's back when they had provided service, you know. <laughs> he treated everybody with respect and love and acceptance. And if we could all do that, our walk would match our talk, wouldn't it? Well, it doesn't stop there. Our speaking needs to match our preaching. What comes out of our mouth matters. In Luke chapter 6 is the par I said is the parallel passage, and let me just turn there. You don't have to, but I'm going to for you. Verse 44, Luke 6 says, For every tree is known by his own fruit, for of thorns men do not gather figs, nor of a bramble bush gather they grapes. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth that which is good, and an evil man out of an evil treasure of his heart brings forth that which is evil. And notice it, it's at the end of verse 45, he says, For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Luke ties all of that good fruit, bad fruit, briars, trees. It, he ties it all with one thing, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. He ties it to what we are saying, that our conversation matters before God. Titus said, or Paul said to Titus in chapter 2, verse 8, sound speech that cannot be condemned. If I could change one word, and, and I know this rule about don't add or subtract the word of God, but if I could just momentarily use this as an illustration, in Matthew 7, 20, it says, by your fruits you shall know them. Could we also say, by their language you shall know them. How is it possible that some come to church on Sunday morning and we take that name of Jesus that we love to sing about and talk about and we praise that name and lift that name up and celebrate that name and say hallelujah to Jesus and then some go out into the work week and when things go wrong, as they normally do, they get that good name of Jesus and then turn it into a vulgar, profane use and drag it through the mud out in the world, don't they understand that that's the only name given among men whereby we must be saved? That's, that's the name that one day every knee will bow and every tongue confess to the glory of God. He is Lord. Your words matter. Our speaking needs to match our preaching. We can preach and tell everybody oh how great the Lord is but does it line up with what's coming out of our mouth? The psalmist said let the words of my mouth 
and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord. <coughs> it doesn't stop there, but I'll give you one more thought that I've got. Our fruitfulness matches our faithfulness. <coughs> faithfulness is forever tied to your walk with God. It's, it's, it's tied to your obedience to, to say yes to God and your obedience to stay in prayer and stay in the Word and stay in fellowship and to abide in Him as we were singing in our last hymn. To abide in Him. He abides in us, we abide in Him. And Jesus said, Abide in me and I in you. A branch cannot bear fruit of itself except you abide in, my, in the vine. No more can you except you abide in me. I'm the vine, you're the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. For without me you can do how much? Do we really believe that? Do we really believe that? Embrace it. Without him, I can do nothing. I don't know that we do. I, I think some people say, well, you know, uh, without him I can do some things on my own and get by. He said, without me you do nothing. And even if we could do, let me tell you something, it would amount to nothing. It would come to nothing. It would be nothing. In the day of judgment before God, what we did on our own will all be burned up. What we do in Him will last. Our fruitfulness Matches our faithfulness. To abide means to stay put. I stay put in Him. I stay put in prayer. I stay put in the Spirit. I stay put in the Word. I, I abide. Now I tell you, we've got fruit trees at our house. Like many of you, we've got cherry trees and peach trees and, and apple trees and pear trees and plum trees and a grapevine. I'll tell you something I've never seen. I have never yet seen, and I don't know that I will, but I've never seen any one of them trees get up and move. I've never seen them cross the yard. I've never seen them wait till dark and then sneak off over to the neighbor's yard. I mean, I've never seen that happen. Now, I had a good friend tell me on the phone this week that he had a tree reach out, jump out and get his truck. <laughs> and he just got her down to the party shop. Some of them trees, you've got to watch them trees. But I've never seen a fruit tree get up and move. I don't know that I ever will. It, they, they grow where they're set out and where they're planted. Whether a squirrel puts that seed in the ground or a bird drops that seed or you buy it at the nursery and you plant it there, they have a tendency to put down roots and stay there. And it doesn't matter what the weather is and it doesn't matter what the conditions are or how rocky the, tree, the ground is, they have a tendency to stay right where they're at and bloom and grow and pro produce fruit where they are planted. And so should we. Call it abide. God placed you in a blessed covenant relationship with the Son, Jesus Christ, gave you the Holy Ghost, blessed you with all graces, and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit, and your fruit should remain. He said, here is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. You'll find that in John 15. It's all tied to being faithful to Him. If you're faithful to Him, you don't have to worry about fruit. If you're faithful to abide in Him, fruit's going to happen. You don't have to worry about, oh, am I being fruitful? You know, we're, we're supposed to be fruity people. Do you know that? It'll happen. You walk with God, it's love, joy, peace. The fruit of the Spirit is going to abound in your life. You don't have to worry about making it happen. It's just going to happen. Have you ever seen a fruit tree went past an orchard and they're out there groaning and straining, uh, trying to push out fruit? Uh, trying to make it happen? They know the secret. All they have to do is let the life flow of the sap <coughs> flow through them. Fruit happens. And when you and I are open to the leading of God and the moving of the Holy Spirit and we let God do what He wants to do and let God be God, fruit happens. 
It's all tied to being faithful. Let me tell you quickly about two people. The most notorious stagecoach robber in California was a man who was called Black Bart. Back in the 1800s, he is credited with 28 stagecoach robberies. He worked alone. He was a gentleman. He wore a flower sack over his head with eyes cut in so they couldn't recognize his face. He wore a black derby and he carried a shotgun. Now there were many barren open miles between one point and another point and, and uh, out in the Wild West in the 1800s there was plenty of places to pull over a stagecoach and do a robbery and he picked them well. Wells Fargo was fit to be tied. They never could catch the guy or apprehend him. And over and over and over, stories was another holdup. But he was so kind. He was so nice. He would just point the shotgun at the stagecoach driver. He would stop and he would kindly say, would you please hand down that box? And they would send it down. The robbery would happen. And off he would go, and, and nobody could figure out who it was until his last robbery. Somebody squeezed off four shots, hit him with one in the hand, and as he was getting away, he dropped a hanky. And the hanky had some initials on it and numbers. And the detectives, the super sleuths back then in the 1800s, took that back to California and started going through all the Chinese laundry places and searching for where did this come from and who is the person that has this, this hanky done at your place of business. And lo and behold, they went through 90 of them and then they found it. The man's name was Charles Bolton. He was one of California's most leading citizens close ties to the police department, reputation as non-smoking, non-drinking, God-fearing man. Everybody thought he had, a, he had ties to the gold mines and uh, he would leave town and tell people that uh, he was off on another business venture when he's really robbing stagecoaches. They shopped with him, they ate with him, they neighbored with him, they, they rubbed shoulders with him in town and nobody had a clue what he was. But one day, fruit emerges, and everybody knows what it is. Same with him. He went to San Quentin for a while. Let me tell you about another man. Wayne Roberts called me and told me he's back from, him and Pat's back from New England, went up to see where he grew up in, in uh, New York, mountain region, and see the family. He said, I met a preacher that have just, he said, I can't get him out of, my, out of my mind. I said, Wayne, can I share this with the church? He said, you go right ahead. He was a missionary for many, many years in his life. Went to Argentina, went to three or four other countries. God put him in places and used him over and over and over the most desolate, remote areas and uh it just seemed like he flourished. The worse the place was, the better he did. Hundreds come to Christ, discipled. Churches were founded. He did a great work. He came back to the States, got in ministry, and he became a park ranger. And uh, if I can say it right, the uh, mountain regions, not the Catskills, the Ad Adirondacks, and that's where he lives today. Wayne said they've been closing churches all over New England and selling them off. People just don't come to church anymore. Selling them off. People are making houses out of them, tearing them down. And this little town of Minerva, New York, this guy's up in his 80s now. They had one church left. And the man said, I'm going, to, I'm going to go and serve there and volunteer at that church and to pastor it. He's been over now. He walks hunched over now. He used to climb the mountains as a park ranger and serve the Lord in all that he did. But today, 
In his mid-80s, he's a broken down man from time and toil. But Wayne says, I sat in the church when he got a hold of the pulpit. He's a man of God. Preaches the word. Little church of maybe a dozen people. But it's an outpost where the word of God is going forth. Served the Lord for years. He's still serving the Lord. Faithful to the call. Faithful to serve. Jesus said, you'll know them by their fruit. The label may say one thing, but you'll know them. You'll know them by their fruits. Jesus says, abide in me, die in you. Apart from me, not much is going to happen that means anything at all. He's keeping score. Don't worry about what others say. God knows. You stay faithful, serving if you think you're in a barren patch, let me tell you what spring's coming in your life. God is going to bear fruit in you and He will use you and you just stay faithful to Him, walk with Him, stay in the Word, stay in the Spirit, stay in prayer. God will use you. doesn't matter how old we are. God is watching. Let's bow our heads. Do men gather grapes from thorns? Lord, what a question. Father, those who are here are your people. They are not thorn bushes. They're not a thistle patch. They are anchored to you. You are the vine. We are the branches. Lord, would you bless us, help us, Father, to hold on to you no matter what the climate and no matter what the situation, whether it rains or the sun shines in life, may we be faithful to you. And Father, would you pour out the Holy Spirit on us and let us be flourishing where you've planted us. We pray that in the name of Jesus. Use us. Father, whether we understand it or not, use us. Whether we're appreciated or not, use us. Whether it's just a little bit or a, a whole lot, Father, would you use us. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Thank you for coming to church today. God bless you all. May we take our cues from that old man that's still hanging on and be fruitful where he's planted us. I'm going to ask us to stand. I'm going to ask Ron if she'll close the service with prayer. God bless you. If you're here and you want prayer, You've got a need. You've got something you just want to get alone with the preacher and say, hey, I need help. You, you get a hold of me and we'll get a hold of God. Don't leave with a burden on your heart. Rhonda, would you pray? Dear God, we thank you again for your love for us, Lord. Help us to be faithful. Help us to stay in your word, Lord. Help us each one to, to produce fruit. Help us to be faithful to you, Lord. Guide us through this week. Help us to be close to you and in your word. In my name we pray.